Good evening and welcome to our public worship service at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with one of our retired pastors, Reverend Richard Vaughan, leading worship this evening. Again, your cooperation in utilising the QR code to record your presence is appreciated. We are still seeking to maintain the most basic health requirement, the physical distancing principle and the wearing of a mask where this cannot be accommodated. Again, just a reminder, no tithes or offerings are taken up during worship. Just uh, with regards to our church family news, the Graham and Marge Ward have now relocated to a different retirement complex and they're very content uh, at the moment, so we, we do praise the Lord for that. We think of our man's family and ask for your continued prayers uh, for their health issues. We think of all our church family members in retirement complexes and ask for your prayers for their well-being. And we do again commend to you those whom we've previously advised who are particularly ill. The activities for this coming week, this uh, Tuesday, would normally be our uh, morning Bible study. It will not be held. That's Tuesday, 23rd of November, due to our state assembly uh, being held uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. We have been asked to pray for the assembly as well, so please keep that in mind on those two days. Thursday evening, 25th of November, is our Bible study via Zoom. Next Saturday, 27th of November, is our annual congregational prayer morning meeting that will be held here in the church between 7am and 9am. We are encouraged to come for one or more of the segments during that time and share in the corporate prayer occasion. Prayer notes have been made available today for either our use next Saturday morning or, or at home if we are unable to come and to use them just generally throughout the coming weeks. Following the prayer morning next Saturday, the session will meet um, also. Next Sunday, that's Sunday the 28th of November, God willing, our, our worship service will be as usual. The morning led by our own pastor, Martin Duffield, and the evening by another of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth. Just by way of advance notice, is the session's intention to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, during both worship services on Sunday the 5th of December. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. good to introduce friends to, to friends and that's why I've sort of reading so many verses from Psalm 104. It's just lovely in this atheistic world to be reminded that uh, this world is God's world and he's got his finger on everything and I hope that uh, Psalm 104 which is not a psalm that's preached on, I, I couldn't find sermons on it but um, it's a beautiful psalm so I'll just read some verses from verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The, the earth is full of your possessions. The great and wide sea, which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. There the ships sail about, and there is that Leviathan, big whales, which you have made to play thee. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they're filled with good. 
You hide your face and they're troubled. You take away their breath and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit. And they're created. You re and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And let's just close our eyes and do that. Heavenly Father, as we come here tonight, we thank you for this psalm. Lord, uh, there are those who say Genesis chapter 1 is poetry. Well, if we want to see Genesis chapter 1 in poetry, we go to Psalm 104. And Father, we see there that the creative work of our Lord did not finish on the sixth day. Every day, God is actively involved in all of the life upon this earth, all of the movements of the heavens, all of the, every, each breath of wind. We don't know where it comes from or where it goes, but it's under the watchful care and control of a sovereign God. Heavenly Father, we come to praise you tonight and, and Father, to confess, Lord, that the... Uh, uh, at times we get inf infected with the atheism roundabout, which sees God nowhere. Lord, you're everywhere. And Heavenly Father, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And when we say praise my, uh, praise my Lord, um, bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord, we are reminded that he is our Lord because, Father, we're his children. And so, Father, as we come here to worship tonight, we pray, Lord, that your presence will be very close to each one of us. Bless us in your word as we open it and look at it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn tonight is uh, one, an Isaac Watts hymn, Not All the Blood of Beasts. Um, of Jew on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. chapter 16 Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 1 
Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you, but you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendour which I had bestowed on you, says the Lord God. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you now to bring our sins before you and to confess, Lord, that there are things about us, Lord, that are less than pleasing to you. And Father, we would not have it so. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the precious Word of God because, Lord, it's a lamp and a light to shine upon our light and to point out those things, those little foxes that spoil the vine, those little sins that spoil our testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ in the face of the world, that take away sometimes our joy, that bring upon us your chastening. Lord, these are the things, Lord, that we are so delight, delighted to know about and thank you Lord that you show them to us and Father we confess them now and uh, Father the reason is that Lord as we read in this scripture from Ezekiel we know Lord what it is you've done for us firstly that's important Lord you, you found us when we were nothing you found us on the scrap heap and Lord you made us went into covenant with us and made us your very own spouse, a covenant relationship with you, not just uh, a master and a lord and one who was gracious to us, but one that even took us in to fellowship to the closest and dearest fellowship imaginable. <coughs> Heavenly Father, one that's pictured by earthly marriage. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Next, Lord, for the love of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father who loved us even to the end uh, and Lord for that that's a great um, it brings upon our hearts the importance Lord of um,
constantly bringing our sin before you, constantly looking to the cross for cleansing, because, Lord, we would not cause our Father to, to, to frown as he looks upon us. We, we seek to please our Father, who we love and who loved us in such an extraordinary way. So, Father, we ask you for your forgiveness for our sins, and, Father, we bring them to the foot of the cross, and we're so grateful as we look to Calvary and see the extent to which you went, even for rebels such as we are. Heavenly Father, uh, tonight we just pray, Lord, as we continue to worship together, Lord, that uh, you would fill our hearts firstly for love for you, but then may that love extend out to one another. One of the things we confess is coldness to our brothers and sisters, to see them as, um, well, we're polite to one another, but Lord, to actually love one another is anything short of that. Is it, it grieves our Heavenly Father because, Lord, we're all in one body under the head. Um, he's the head and, and we're the members of his body. And, Lord, we just pray that we will be able to delight you in this, that at least we love one another. And next, also, that we grow in our love for you. And we ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'll turn now to our next hymn. It's take time to be holy. And uh, taking time to be holy means spending time in prayer, spending time with the word, spending time in fellowship, and um, in our home life, share our love around the home, and uh, be kindly one to another. This is pleasing to God, a Christian home. Take time to be holy, speak oft with the Lord, abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek.
time we don't take up an offering, but um, we have other ways of giving out tithes and offerings. But we do um, pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless the gifts we bring. And um, we, we just have a short interlude of music. And, um, but first we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this life that you've given to each one of us. Lord, what a privilege it is to be born a person, Father, um, and then, Lord, to be redeemed and to be made anew into the image of God and given the certainty of eternity around the throne of the Lord in glory. And Father, to have that hope that when Jesus returns to this earth to make all things new, as we read about in Psalm 104, let the, the wicked be consumed from the earth. And Lord, that prayer will be answered on that day. And though there will be no wickedness, it will be all righteousness. And Lord, to have a, a, a part in that promised um, blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ at his return, Lord, that is beyond our uh, comprehension. And Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that um, for the extension of your kingdom, uh, you, you asked us to pray, thy kingdom come. You said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, Father, um, it's very much uh, uh, the heart on our, uh, our Father's mind. He is a, an evangelistic God. Um, and Father, he has a message for the nations and Heavenly Father, that is our brief while we're here on this earth to spread the gospel. And so, Father, we just pray that you would bless these offerings we bring. We'd like to see your kingdom extended. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. on earth, sorry, nor riches on earth could have saved my poor soul. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Saviour now maketh me whole. We rise to sin.
two weeks ago when I took this evening service, we had pretty well the same reading as tonight, but it's not that I'm forgetful when I'm doing the same sermon, but uh, I thought it would be a good revision. I'm just moving on one verse, and tonight we're just dealing with one verse. That's John 3.16. But uh, we did... So, anyway, we, we'll have our reading now from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. The Gospel of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lift, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practising evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done in God. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Well, they're very precious verses, and we're coming now to what's probably the, the fellow text for a lot of us. Uh, beautiful verse up in John 3 16. And. Um, Let's just come before the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, our hearts are already lifted up, even to the heights of heaven, in just hearing the reading of these verses, which are so sweet to our ears, and so profound to our mind, and so life-changing to our hearts. Lord, we thank you that your goodness, in your goodness, you have allowed these verses to be in the original uh, manuscript that the Apostle John wrote 
and they've been able to come down through the centuries to us and they've been preserved by your providence. And now we can pick up our Bibles and read these verses and have an even greater understanding of who you are and what you've done for us. And so, Lord, as we look at these verses tonight, I pray that you would give us very attentive hearts and very focused eyes that we can see truths, perhaps, that we haven't connected before and for some, perhaps, even for the first time. And so we thank you, Lord, for what's represented in these truths and thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and thank you for such a perfect Saviour as he is. And Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I could have given this uh, address tonight, the, uh, if I gave it a title, I'd call it the purest gospel. I think I just put John 3.16 and uh, everybody knows what we're going to be talking about. Um, but what leaps off the page as we read it is um, that it, we really have the purest expression we can imagine of the gospel and uh, maybe even the most pure expression in the entire scriptures. The Gospel is everywhere in the Bible from Genesis 1 uh, right through until Revelation. Um, often we don't see it. We, a lot of times I, I hear the Old Testament preached on as though we're, we're, Old Testament, we're an Old Testament church. But Jesus Christ is everywhere, the Gospel is everywhere um, and it, it certainly can't be missed here. And this particular verse, it's a very, uh, very clear expression of the truths of the Gospel. The word gospel, uh, euangelion, in the original Greek, it just means, as you all would probably know, it just means good news. Um, it's the good news of salvation that God and, uh, and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, have provided. And when it's believed, uh, God delivers the sinner from eternal condemnation and instead uh, gives to them eternal life. And because of this, the gospel is not just good news. It's the greatest news. It's, it's the greatest news that anyone can hear in their entire life. And you'll never hear anything greater than what we have tonight in our text. Um, we're right at the summit. Um, it's, uh, it's, you can't really think of anything greater to put on your lips when you to speak to another person or to a, a family member than what we have in these verses. And uh, as we look at them, I believe that Jesus uh, here in John, uh, John 3, 16, continues to be the speaker as he was up to this point. Um, he, he addresses Nicodemus in this extended dialogue and, and it's now turning into a discourse on the new birth. And uh, just so that you'll know, there, uh, there is some debate among scholars uh, who look at the Bible with big spectacles and uh, they debate whether this, these are the words of Jesus or whether the Apostle John has taken over and he's writing these words. In either case, uh, these words are equally inspired and equally true, but myself, I favour um, the, um, those who come down on the side that, John, that is not John at all, but uh, the Lord Jesus, these are the actual words that Jesus Christ himself spoke and was speaking and continued to speak to Nicodemus. Uh, for that reason, uh, even though I think it's rather strange to write the words of Jesus in red in the, in the New King James, um, if, if that's what they want to do, at least I, I, I'm glad they came down in favour of writing these verses in red. Um, but I personally think that it's a continuous flow of what Jesus has to say and there's no interruption at all. And so what we have here is the greatest evangelist um, who ever lived, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to seek and to save souls, bringing the greatest message that's ever been delivered because in front of him there, there's a lost soul and Jesus is presenting the gospel. And this particular lost soul is the teacher of Israel. And so it's a, a remarkable interreaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. And um, actually what we have here is Jesus and he's preaching on Jesus. Um, this is Jesus preaching Christ and him crucified. It's Jesus' own commentary on the cross, if you like. And so it's about as pure as it can be. And so we just ask that God will give us all 
ears to hear and eyes to see something of the glory of the gospel tonight. Um, Jesus calls these words heavenly things. We read that was something we dealt, dealt with uh, last time I was talking to you from verse 13. Um, they concern the Son of Man who's come down from heaven. And uh, verse 16, it's the, uh, we have here that, that message of the gospel. And that's what uh, John 3.16 is. It's, we have the most famous summary of, the, of the, the gospel in the entire Bible. And so that for that reason, I'd like to slow right down and just look at this verse, word for word for word, all the way through. Um, and so we come to the very first word. The very first word is for. For God so loved the world. Now, it's very important to notice for. It, 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 it might sound superfluous to say that, but there's a lot of people who miss that. For, because immediately it connects us back to verses 16. Uh, uh, from verses 16, it connects us back to verses 14 and 15. And that's very important because it makes it crystal clear to us, doesn't it? That Jesus is not talking about the incarnation, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son at Bethlehem, but he's talking about the cross. Jesus, he, um, it's, he's talking about the death of Jesus. And so there's a huge difference here. And uh, we looked uh, at it last week, a uh, like fortnight ago, in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's the cross. And now we come to verse 16, 4. Uh, this means Jesus now is giving an explanation, his own explanation, of those verses 14 and 15 that we looked at. Jesus, he's the master teacher. And uh, he's, he, uh, not only does he teach the truth, but then he backs up and he explains the truth. And that's what he's doing in uh, uh, John 3, 16. He's explaining what he's just said to Nicodemus. For God. And God, God refers here to God the Father. Now, it's very important truth again. Everything about the, about the gospel flows from God the Father. God the Father, he is the author of the gospel. God the Father, he's the great architect and the source of the gospel. Everything about the gospel is flowing from God the Father. And it's very sad to say that I believe that a case can be made today uh, in contemporary Christianity that the forgotten member of the Trinity is God the Father. Uh, we become so riveted sometimes on the Lord Jesus Christ, rightly so, uh, and so attention giving to the Holy Spirit, again, rightly so, that standing over in the shadows and out of our notice so many times is God the Father. And so here, the Lord Jesus Christ intentionally draws our attention to his Father, to God the Father. It's God the Father and his infinite genius of, and mind who designed the gospel. It's God the Father who in love sent the Son. And he sent, and he, and uh, it's, uh, and it's God the Father with the Son who sent the Holy Spirit. And it's God the Father who has predestined us. It's God the Father who called us. It's God the Father who justified us. It, and it's God the Father who will glorify us. It's all God the Father. And from him and through him and to him are all things. It, uh, Paul writes in Romans 11.36. To God the Father be glory forever and ever. They're scripture words. And so let us, as we think on these verses, not only be focused on our Saviour, the gift, but also we don't forget the giver, who is God the Father, who so loved the world. Now, the word so, uh, it, it stresses the intensity of our Father's love. He so loved the world. He so greatly loved the world. He loved the world so intensely. It was a very strong love. He strongly loved the world. The word love here, it speaks of God's determinative choice to love those whom he will love. There's certainly nothing within us 
that's of any good that would have drawn down the love of God from heaven to us. There's nothing in us that was attractive that could possibly have caused God to love us. No, Ezekiel 16 put it very, very well, didn't it? Your nativity was from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite, did with the words we read. So it's easy for us to love lovely people, people who are lovable, but God so loved an unlovable world, a world that was in rebellion, a world that is in anarchy and still is. And R.C. Sproul would say, a world that was in cosmic treason against God the Father. He often used that term when he was with us, cosmic treason. God looked beyond our sin. He looked to our greatest need and he's chosen to love the world. That world that his own holiness detests. That world that his own holiness abhors and hates and loathes. There's more to the story than, that, than just that God loves the world. The holiness of God hates the world. You can read Psalm 5, you can read Psalm 7. God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all, they that, all the people that forget God. Romans 1, 18, etc. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. That statement we hear so often, that God hates the sin but he loves the sinner, it's very, very wrong. God also hates the sinner. So this makes this verse extraordinary. That those whom his holiness detests, God on them God has determined to set his love upon a world that is the object of his holy wrath. This love is an inexplicable love from a human perspective. This love can only be explained by the fact that this love is self-determined within God toward us. This love is a self-originating love within God toward us. There was nothing outside of God to us that drew down his love. This love is, all gener is an all generated love from within God. He so loved the world. The love of God is one of the most cherished attributes of God that's expressed in the entire Bible. And we would say amen to that. 1 John 4, 8. We all learnt that verse on our mother's knee. God is love. And it's so important that John repeats it in the same chapter later on in the 16th verse. Again he writes, God is love. And God has chosen to love the least likely and the most unlovable people in the entire universe. And of course that's myself and it includes you too. When we set the holiness of God in its proper place, and when we set the depravity of man in its proper place, you actually magnify the, the love of God that spanned that enormous chasm. But when you've got a view of God that's a little bit more like us, and you've got a view of man that's just a little bit more like God, and a little bit more than how the Bible presents man as a, as a helpless sinner, then the love of God becomes really no big deal. And people can go around saying glibly, God loves me, God loves you. But when you've got a holy God who hates sin, and when you've got a corrupt man who hates God, the distance of this chasm of the love of God to be extended from the heights of heaven right down to the depths of where we are is amazing love. It's an inexplicable love. It leaves you breathless. That God in his heart of hearts has chosen of his own free will to love us, not because of us, but in spite of us. He chose to love us not because of us. He chose to love us because of him. 
and in his in the infinite love astound, astounding love that's present within himself Martin Luther once said God didn't love us because we're valuable we're valuable because God loves us and so this verse it gives glory where the glory is intended to God that God would initiate such a relationship with such despicable people as we all are and so the Lord Jesus says God so loved the world Jesus knew all about that and notice he says the world Nicodemus not just Jews not just the notion of Israel including Gentiles and so at this point in the conversation the intention of Jesus he's not addressing the extent of the atonement as false teachers will tell us Jesus tells us about the extent of the atonement later on over in John chapter 10 if you want to read about the extent of the atonement but at this ju juncture the intent of Jesus was to convey to Nicodemus the magnitude and the breadth and the height of the love of God in sending the one standing in front of Nicodemus himself the saviour of the world to on a rescue mission it's this love of God that extends beyond Israel to the four corners of the earth that's what Jesus is communicating to Nicodemus what we have to understand about Nicodemus is that Nicodemus was a Pharisee he was a, he would have been probably the chief Pharisee the, the chief teacher of the Jews and these Pharisees were very very sectarian they were very prejudiced they were very narrow-minded and they thought that God only loved them God only loved the Jews the Messiah was coming to the Jews and uh, this is this is very much represented if you uh, go back to the Old Testament in the story of Jonah and we remember um, the prophet Jonah that God commissioned him to go to Nineveh um, that great Gentile city we, we read stories about King Sennacherib and so on in, um, in Isaiah but uh, Jonah was sent down there to, to that um, wicked nation and um, to preach the gospel to them and deep down in his heart and, and Jonah lets on that he secretly knew that because God was a God of mercy he would extend his mercy even to these Gentiles that was the reason he ran away people make all sorts of reasons why Jonah ran away but Jonah gives the pot away right at the end of the book after when he was sitting under the juniper tree he knew God was gracious and he and that grace in Jonah's mind was reserved for the Jewish nation not for the Assyrians and so I think Jonah is really representative of how prejudiced the nation, whole nation of Israel was in fact in the very next chapter in chapter 4 Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman and you remember what she said to him how can you being a Jew speak to me who, am a, who is a Samaritan I mean you don't even we don't even talk together you don't even talk to us uh, and so the message of for Nicodemus who was the teacher of Israel who was the ruler of the Jews who was a Pharisee was Nicodemus at this point you need to open your eyes when we're talking about the love of God you've just got to start opening your eyes a little bit wider and to understand that yes God loves the world but he doesn't just mean Israel he really loves the world and you need to understand that God in the gospel is greatly enlarged on your picture and that his love reaches much beyond Israel it's too great to be contained in one little nation um, the promise to you of a saviour in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be nations of the earth be blessed uh, Nicodemus go and read again your scriptures um, and then of course um, we know the love of God is just so great that it reaches out to every tribe and every tongue and every people group and every nation and let me say every denomination it's it, it's not limited God doesn't see these distinctions they're here I don't know how come but they're here but they're, they're not something God sees these distinctions 
And he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. No particular group, to every creature. So, how much does God love the world? How much would you say? Question. Do you say, God loves the world a little bit? Or God loves the world a lot? Well, we have right here in the middle of verse 16, we've got the answer to our question. He, God loved the world this much, that he gave unto death on the cross. He gave his only son. Again, I, I emphasise, he's not talking about the incarnation. The reference here is to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, because the Son of Man being lifted up has just been mentioned before in verse 14, so we know that's the answer to our question. And the next question, it's also another important question, we could ask, who actually crucified the Lord Jesus? Who was responsible? Well, the Romans, the Jews, of course. But ultimately, the, the, uh, the, uh, what was organised and orchestrated on that um, Passover afternoon was ultimately the work of God the Father, planned from the beginning of the of time, who play who he played the initiating active role in everything that occurred. It was God the Father who gave unto death his only begotten Son, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Yes, you have taken by wicked hands, but by get, the, get the, the, the beginning of that verse, the greatness of the love of God. You see, the love of God is, let me just say it, sorry. Love is, let define that. It's, love is what sacrificially gives of itself to reach the highest good in another. That's a little definition of love. Sacrificially gives of itself to reach the highest good of another. Lust takes. It's mistaken for love in this world, but it takes. Love gives. And God the Father, this is the greatest demonstration of love in the entire history of the world, in the history of mankind. There has never been love like this, that God the Father loved the world so much that he intentionally, he purposely, even eternally, chose to give his only son. God only has one son. That, that elevates too the value of the gift, supply and demand. The supply is very low, the demand remains. Well, the value of the price goes up. I, I like the word in my French Bible. I love reading my Bible in French. It's beautiful because it's a, it's a, it's a lovely language. But it, his son, unique, unique, his unique son. The French word for only is just unique. That's what they, the word they use when they want to say only. God gave his unique, his only begotten son. And in the Greek language, the word is monogenes, monogenes, which simply means one of a kind. God gave his one-of-a-kind son. There was no other son like the Lord Jesus Christ. The God-man. God gave his monogamous son. God gave his unlike any other son in the universe. God gave the son that shares his, all of his own attributes perfectly. God gave the son that he has loved throughout all eternity past, without beginning, God gave the son of his greatest love for us, for us. How great must be the love of God for us that God would give his most loved only son to die for us. God the Father could not have loved us any more than to give the only begotten son, his only begotten son to death on the cross. John 8, 56. Jesus said to them, talking to the Pharisees, Abraham, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He, he saw it and was glad. You don't believe in me, but Abraham did. And he saw my day and he rejoiced. Well, have you, no doubt you've sometimes wondered, look, reading the story of Abraham through, just when did Abraham see 
the die of the Lord Jesus. Well, probably if we knew, he saw it over and over and over. But one time we could look, think of very clearly would be Mount Moriah. When as Abram, as he was raising the knife to slay Isaac at, at the command of God, the Lord intervened and called from heaven and uh, over in the side, caught in a, by the horns in a thicket, was a ram. And uh, you, I can imagine as Abraham took the ram, pondering all these strange events, and as he was about to slay the, slay the ram that was taking the place of Isaac, his son, so that Isaac could be spared, he understood the Lamb of God who would not be spared. His Isaac was spared, his son was spared, but the father was not going to spare his son. And Abraham, in his heart at that point, would have understood the depth of the love of God for him, that he would give, deliver up his son. And Abraham saw, saw his day and was glad. He was glad. God would deliver up his son to die in Abram's place to bear away his sin. And Abram rejoiced to see my day, said Jesus. God giving his only son to bear away our sin makes us glad. God demonstrates his, love, his own life toward us, his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave his son for his enemies. God gave his son for his foes. God gave his son for those who were in rebellion against him. And the other verse is, uh, uh, that's, sorry, Romans 5.8. I just, I meant to miss that bit out. Uh, we have these two verses. I just wanted to give you two cross references on that, that's all. First one was God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The other one was Ephesians 2.4. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And it's the enormity of God's love that is brought out here. It far exceeds human vocabulary to even begin to describe it. And now, as we continue in verse 16, it says that whosoever, I like that better than whoever, whosoever, Jesus says, whosoever, and as he's saying this, the, 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 the Saviour who loves sinners, I believe, is looking very tenderly into the eyes of Nicodemus. So looking deeply into his eyes, Nicodemus, this has got your name on it. I'm talking to you. Um, this is the gospel from heaven, myself. Whosoever uh, believes in him, in the one sent from heaven, whosoever believes in me, and uh, we need to pause and believe because many times it's, it is not understood. It is not an intellectual uh, knowledge of the facts anyone can learn the gospel of. There's books everywhere to explain it. It's not difficult. You can learn it and you can talk about it and you can even believe what you read, every word of it. But it's not just an assent to the facts that you read, that's not to believe. To believe means, first of all, I, I look to my old friend Thomas Brooks here for some help. It means firstly to know that I'm helpless and lost. To be carnally minded is death and to know that about myself. And to believe, uh, Thomas Brooks says, points to the next one he's, he lists, um, is. I, I, I know I stand in need of somebody outside of myself to save me from the wrath to come. I'm under wrath because of my sin. And so believe next is to put all my confidence in Christ alone. Jesus has to become to me, for me, myself, my all-sufficient saviour. Jesus is mighty to save. He's mighty to save me from the curse. He's mighty to save me from hell too. And that would be my rightful punishment for my sins. 
And so to believe means placing all my trust in Jesus Christ. The person who believes needs to make a definite choice, a decisive choice, to turn, to, it's a choice two ways, the ch choice to turn firstly from this world and then to turn the heart all to Christ. It's a little bit like getting married and Paul uses that analogy in 2 Corinthians 11 too. I have a spouse due to Christ. And when I married Lynette, I turned, I promised to be faithful to her and all through and until death us part. Uh, and death us do part. And when we come to Christ, we turn our back on all other loves, all other lovers, and we fix our heart and our love upon Christ alone, and he becomes our only one to commit all that I am to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that really, that's really brought out in, in the, this text, in the choice of words in John 3.16, when it says, in who, whoever believes in him, whoever believeth in him, because the little word ice in French, I in Greek, ice doesn't just mean in, there's two words for in in Greek, this one means into. It means to believe into Christ. Not just to believe in, in about him, but to actually believe into the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds us of those little things where Jesus called himself the vine and where the, the branches are known as we're grafted into him and share the sap and share the life of, of, of God that flows through the Lord Jesus Christ. Abide in me, um, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone to save you. And if you're trusting in Christ, if you're trusting in Christ, maybe your baptism, well, you haven't yet trusted in him. If you're trusting in Christ and, and your uh, church membership and, and, uh, and your work for the church, uh, or Christ and any uh, uh, of in your morality and your good works, well, you haven't yet come all the way in, to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's not until you put both camps, both feet across the line, and you burn your bridges before you. Um, and Thomas Brooks puts it this way, given a, a bill of divorce to all your other lovers, to leave even my dearest and sweetest sins, he said, and, and you're entirely committed to Jesus Christ alone to save you. That's saving faith. Well, finally tonight, what's the result? Right at the end of verse 16, it's worth just slowing down here because Jesus puts it in a negative and then in a positive. There's a negative and a positive dimension because all true salvation has a negative and a positive dimension. We're saved from something and we're saved to something else. It's not an either or, it's not one or the other, it's both. You can't be saved to something without being saved from something at the same time. So Jesus begins like the master teacher that he is. You, need, you normally begin with a negative denial and then after that you have the positive assertion. That's the way the great teachers of the church down through the ages and down through the centuries taught. First a negative denial, then the positive assertion. So Jesus begins with a negative denial. We will not perish. Will not perish. Will not. It indicates the absolute certainty of our salvation in Jesus Christ. To perish, it means to be consumed with the eternal wrath and judgment of God in a real place called hell. That lake of fire that, uh, and brimstone that burns forever with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the worm never dies, held in chains of darkness forever, will not perish there. This says, will not perish. It means you're, there's a definite escape from the wrath of Holy God that we all deserve to suffer in hell forever. You will not perish, says Jesus. That's his words. Well, that's good news. So we don't let that slip by, do we? Don't let that slip past you. I mean, we were once, like everyone, we were born on death row. We were declared to be condemned by Holy God. And it would have been just a matter of time before we would be escorted 
into the flames of hell. So it's very good news that we will not perish. But um, one of the R.C. Sproul's favourite words was but. Praise God for buts in the Bible. But have, notice this tense here, it's not future tense, but have, present tense, eternal life. Right now, eternal life. And that answers this question, when are you, when does a believer receive eternal life? Do we have to wait till we die to receive eternal life? No, says Jesus, it's present tense. We will have now eternal life. That's why Jesus says to Martha, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this? Martha had to think about that. Well, um, right, it's a right now eternal life and that's the greatest thing that we can imagine. And, if, and if, if we don't have eternal life now, we'll never have eternal life in the life to come. If you're to have eternal life, you've got to receive eternal life now. And there's only one way to receive eternal life now, and that's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as I told you last time, eternal life, um, it speaks of the quality of that life, you read through the, 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 the epistles and Paul tells you of the, the love and the joy and the peace that comes through believing, the joy of the Holy Spirit, the many blessings that are ours. They're ours for now. He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of holiness. And it also then next speaks of the duration of this life. Literally, it's eternal life is the life of the world to come. We um, have presently the life of the world to come, even though we're not there yet. And this is a life that endures forever. This is why it endures forever. It's eternal life. And so this is the message of the Gospel. Well, I know we've taken a long time on that one verse tonight, but I hope that it's been a blessing. And uh, it's arguably the greatest verse in the entire Bible. Uh, it's certainly the favourite verse of, of uh, just about all Christians. Uh, that even people who can't quote much of the Bible, I think they can say John 3.16, and maybe the Lord's Prayer, and perhaps Psalm 23. But this is one of those three passages. And it's the message of the Gospel. It's a good verse. So I, I just need to finish by asking the question. It's clear. Have you believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God? The one that God sent into the world, the God who loves us, God the Father, to be the saviour of those who are perishing, to rescue them. Have you committed your life to Jesus Christ? That's the question. And uh, if you've never done that, well, I urge you to do that right this moment. There's no need to come to the front, there's no need to put up hands, there's none of these things. It's between you and God. And you, God, the Lord Jesus has arms open wide, and the Father has open arms open wide to receive all those any sinner who will put his faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that leads us on. We haven't got time for it tonight, but Psalm said the, your homework is to finish the chapter and just look at verse 17 and how beautifully verse 17 fits in with verse 16. Anyway, let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again for these very precious verses and not just for really how beautifully they read but for what they say and what they tell us. Lord, to us they are precious to our souls and we delight in what we read here and thank you for loving such sinners as we are and thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. And so Father we rise up, we bless your name, you are not the forgotten person of the Trinity to us. Our heart is set upon you as it is set upon your Son and also set upon your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for being so gracious to us and we hallow your name and we ask that your kingdom may come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn tonight is Something for Thee, Saviour Thy Dying Love Thou Gavest Me. Nor should I aught withhold, dear Lord, from thee. In love my soul would bow, my heart fulfill its vow. Some offering bring thee now, something for thee.
peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>